I laid in bed, trying to muster the motivation to get up for my 8 a.m. sociology lecture. As a freshman at SDSU, I'd gotten into the habit of knocking myself out with a few healthy shots of NyQuil each night, propelling myself into eight hours of menthol-flavored menthol coma-like slumber. It was really the only way I could sleep through my roommate's freight train snores and the regular rotation of Marines she brought home. <laughs> I knuckled the sleep from my eyes and blinked, bracing myself for the glaring sunlight that bore through our plastic blinds. But my room looked like it was midnight, not the 6.46 a.m. I knew my alarm had been set for. I listened as my residence hall neighbors started their days. Wet flip-flops squeaked as girls returned from the shower. A toxic cloud of Victoria's Secret Love Spell body spray wafted <laughs> under the door from the hallway. Impatient orders crackled from the Jack in the Box drive through right outside my window. I blinked harder. My vision remained dark and unfocused. Was I so deep in a NyQuil fog that my body woke up before my eyeballs? I groped around for my phone, and bringing it within inches of my eyes, I could make out that it was almost 7 a.m. But as I moved the phone away from my face, it fell out of focus again. I repeated this several times, and it slowly sunk in that something more than a NyQuil overdose was going on here. A panic started to rise in my stomach. I groped around my room, feeling for familiar landmarks. Metal bed frame, desk, chair, door handle. I felt like a mime trying to find my way out of a box I couldn't actually see. And I stumbled across the hall and I pounded on my best friend's door. She didn't have class until 10 a.m., but waking up blind seemed like a good reason to disturb her. As soon as she eased her door open, I grabbed her wrist and I held her hand up to my face. With her palm about two inches from my eyes, I said, I can see that. And then I pushed her hand back, but not that. I think I NyQuiled myself blind. <laughs> Sam immediately snapped into mom mode. She helped me get dressed and then led me across campus to student health services as I bumbled along beside her like a giant drunk baby. Once in an exam room, I waited for what felt like days, feeling suffocated by the dark haze that hung around me. Finally, the, the door to the exam room clicked open and a clammy hand rested on my knee. And I jumped, startled by the sudden uninvited touch. Jessica, I hear you're not having a very good day, a man's voice said. I pushed his hand off my leg and tried to resituate myself further from his reach. I can't see. Well, how much did you drink last night, the voice asked. Did you take anything like that may not have been your medicine, something for fun? Um, I didn't drink anything. It's a Tuesday and I don't do drugs. Well, the day of the week doesn't really stop most people around here. If you can just tell me the truth, I'll be able to help you a lot faster, he lectured. I didn't drink, I didn't do any drugs. I just woke up and I can't fucking see. Okay, okay, he said, patting me on the leg again while I recoiled. Let's not get hysterical. He launched into a series of condescending and embarrassing questions. After covering every potentially humiliating topic from my last period, to the frequency of my bowel movements, recreational drug use, and a list of recent sexual partners, I was sent back to my dorm room to sleep it off and see if I felt better after a good nap. I knew something was wrong, but the smarmy doctor was convinced that I was just some strung out, hungover party girl who woke up on the wrong side of frat row. I was certain that I needed more than just a nap. As Sam guided me back across campus, I asked her to drive me to the emergency room at Alvarado Hospital. When I got to the ER, I fumbled my way through the necessary paperwork, but I wasn't bleeding. I didn't have a foreign object protruding from my body. None of my bones were broken. So 
I was a low priority compared to the chainsaw accidents, drug overdoses, and stab wounds that supposedly surrounded me. So I sat and I cried silently to myself with tears running down my cheeks and pooling in the corners of my frustrated scowl. Unable to see a clock, time had become a fluid concept. I had no idea how long I'd been waiting, but it felt like days. Finally, a doctor flicked back the curtain around my bed. I recounted the basic facts of my sudden vision loss. I heard the click of his pen, a few audible acknowledgments as I talked, but largely, he stayed quiet. When I finished, there was such a long pause, I had to ask if he was still there. I heard the squeak and the roll of a chair, and I felt him sidle up to the edge of my bed. Jessica, he said slowly, I'm sure what you're experiencing is a little scary. I have some ideas, and we're going to do some tests. We'll get to the bottom of all of it. Relief flooded my body. He'd actually listened to me, and he had a plan that was more focused than a nap. His list of likely, likely suspects included everything from syphilis. And yes, I know what you're thinking. SDSU did have a syphilis outbreak in the early 2000s, but no, I was not a part of it. To cat scratch fever. Did you know that was more than just a song? It's an actual disease. To multiple sclerosis, glaucoma, and diabetes. The litany of tests he ordered included several MRIs, an EEG, an EMG, a C-spine MRI, a CT scan, a complete al alphabet soup of tests and procedures that I didn't understand and couldn't comprehend because I couldn't actually read the consent paperwork, which I had signed blindly, literally. I also received a heavy dose of steroids, goopy eye drops that made my nose bleed, a drug test, a pregnancy test, and an IV to help rehydrate me from all of the drinking that I hadn't done the night before. Oh, and a pelvic exam, because why the fuck not? I'm still really confused by this one because the last time I checked, my eyes are not directly connected to my twat. <laughs> but the most torturous part of my experience was nonchalantly described as just a quick little poke to help the doctors analyze my spinal fluid and rule out any infections like meningitis. I was assured that I wouldn't feel a thing. My spinal tap was not the jaunty good time that the 80s mockumentary promised me it would be. There was no song and dance, no pithy quips. It was me face down on a metal table with my legs and arms strapped to my sides while I silently cried into a paper pillow, covering my face in salty tears and snot. Thanks to the massive dose of steroids pumped into my body, my vision had partially returned, and I could see shapes and light again as the room slowly returned to focus, which made it all the more horrifying when, during my spinal tap, my limited mobility meant I was forced to watch the screen that displayed the needle placement for the doctors. Strapped to the table, I could either suffocate in my pillow puddle or turn my head to the side where a giant screen was projected onto the wall to guide the doctors during their procedure. I could literally see myself from the inside and was forced to watch as a giant metal thread snaked its way along my spine. This did not seem safe. Throughout the 90-minute procedure, the metal table would rattle and a nurse would place a hand on my shoulder, telling me to try and stay still. What I didn't realize, since I was numb from the waist down, was that my body was flopping around like a fish each time the needle grazed the nerve endings along my spinal cord. In the days following the procedure, a pattern of bruises would bloom along my legs from where I had thrashed against the restraints and slammed myself against the exam table. The spinal tap was inconclusive. The MRI was inconclusive. The CT scan was inconclusive. The EEG, the EMG, the C-spine MRI were all inconclusive. With no solid answers and an increasing number of questions, I grew more and more disgruntled as my hospital stay progressed. My phone had died hours ago, and I desperately needed to hear a familiar voice, but I had no way of getting a hold of anyone. 
I was tired. I was scared. It was approaching 2 a.m., and I wanted to go home. The ER nurse informed me that I would be staying the night. They didn't feel comfortable discharging me because perhaps, she mused, I might be a little mentally unstable. She said that the doctors felt my symptoms didn't quite add up. Did they think I was faking this? How do you even fake being blind? Realizing that my medical team thought I was a big fat hypochondriac sent me into a full-blown meltdown. I laid flat on my back in the hospital bed, still numb from the spinal tap, and sobbed so hard I started dry heaving and eventually progressed into a full-blown panic attack. I was held at Alvarado Hospital for psychiatric evaluation for two days. My vision had gradually returned to normal, but I had such an obscene amount of steroids coursing through my veins, I could probably hurl a minivan full of minions across a football field. My emotions and my patients were frayed. After being called a drug addict and a slut, and then being accused of being a hypochondriac and a head case, I had to wonder if these people actually cared about my well-being at all. But with my vision restored and no indication that I was a danger to myself, I was sent home with nothing but a referral to another series of doctors. For the next two years, I had MRIs and eye exams every six weeks. My blindness was at bay, but my optic nerves were damaged and my peripheral vision would likely never return to normal. And there was still no explanation for any of it. I had been discounted, dehumanized, and doubted. Not a single procedure had produced any insightful re results. Fed up with structuring my life around doctor's appointments, I decided that as long as I could see, that was good enough for me. I started dodging calls from my neurologist's office and deleting their voicemails without listening to them. About a year after my last appointment, I received a registered letter in the mail. My neurologist had been sued for malpractice and would be closing his practice in California and moving to Florida, which is apparently where shitty doctors, crooked politicians, and women's reproductive rights go to die. But the glimmer of hope that maybe someone could fix me lured me back in and I agreed to be seen by another doctor. Weeks later, sitting in an exam room, I prickled with anxiety. The trauma of my whole ordeal was still very real under the surface of my calm exterior. I recognized the MRI films mounted on the light board. After only a few minutes of waiting, the doctor strode into the room, smiling. She introduced herself, shook my hand, and for the first time in any of my doctor's visits, she asked me how I was doing. After a brief update on my health history, she referred to the scans on the wall. This, she said, using her finger to circle an area near the base of my skull, this is your pituitary gland, she said. This, she said, gesturing to another area, is not. This is a tumor. And looking back over your scans, it's present in every single one of them, she concluded. I have a tumor? Yes. Previously, this tumor was enlarged, and it put pressure on your optic nerves, which is ultimately what caused your vision, vision loss, she explained. I had known this woman for all of five minutes, and she had just explained everything that had been wrong with me. So, I said, waiting for more information. So, we're kind of done here, she said. <laughs> we solved your mystery. She could see that I was still clearly confused. Your tumor is small and benign, and as far as I can tell, it can stay. Unless it starts to bother you again or you have issues with your vision, we don't have to remove it, she concluded. More than 10 years later, I haven't had any further issues with my vision, no mentions of cat scratch fever, MS, or syphilis. My peripheral vision will never return. So merging on the freeway is a lot like a real life game of Frogger, and sneaking up on me is really easy. 
living with the knowledge that there's a tumor just hanging out in my brain isn't exactly comforting, but other than the occasional freak out when my arm falls asleep or my eyelid twitches, I don't really think about little Timmy the tumor all that much. In the initial months after my diagnosis, I spiraled, wondering when, not if, my tumor would flare up again, sending my life into another medical tailspin. I even met with my new neurologist one more time to discuss surgical options, just in case. But when I found out I'd have to shave part of my head, I bailed. <laughs> I guess my vanity was more important than my sanity. Despite the fact that he is quite literally constantly on my mind, I've decided that it's a lot easier to go through my life as though I've never met Timmy, rather than constantly wondering how he's gonna fuck up my future. Plus, I really don't think I'd look good bald. Let's hear it for Jessica Rogers. <laughs>